بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سيدة زينب says when she is asked by Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, how do you view the death of your brother and your Ahlul Bayt? And she replies by saying, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I have not seen anything except that of beauty. Insha'Allah, tonight's topic and the talk for tonight we'll be looking at and discussing the aspect of patience by looking at the life of Sayyida Zainab alayhi afdal salati wa salam. And as we know, the pivotal point in which Karbala was not only sacrificed, but the person that came forth, as we'll be discussing later on tonight, and offered the sacrifice, the person that upheld the religion of Islam and preached it in the face of the tyrants as they went from city to city, was none other than Sayyida Zainab. And we'll look at the importance of this figure during the course of the lecture for tonight. So inshallah tonight we'd like to look at patience. But first, when we discuss Sayyida Zainab, we want to look at how she was brought up at her early age. How did the people around her, her family, try to look after her emotional side? How her family tried to raise her in the school of thought because they knew Karbala was coming. And how Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al Zahra tried to get her ready for such a day. And after that, we'll be discussing the aspect of patience and how it goes hand in hand with having knowledge of the outcomes and having knowledge about the mercy and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we want to look at a qasim that Sayyida Zainab said to Imam Zain al Abidin, And we want to analyze, has or hasn't Sayyida Zainab lived up to that particular qasim? As in when someone says and brings forth the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know very, 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 very importantly that our Imams never use qasim. The Prophet never uses qasim except for dire circumstances or to prove a very important point across to the other person. Now Sayyidah Zainab comes and she says a qasim, which we'll be discussing. And we want to analyze how truthful she was in that qasim. Inshallah, to start the topic for tonight, please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Prophet of Islam, we know in narrations, when Fatima al-Zahra first gives birth towards Imam Hassan, and Imam Hassan was given to the Prophet of Islam. The Prophet of Islam begins to cry. And they begin to ask him, why do you cry? Is just a newborn? Is there any deformities? And he replies by saying, no. But Jibra'il has come down and told me how he will die. And how my ummah will kill him. The same happened to Imam Hussein. In which the Prophet of Islam cries. And he says, Jibra'il has come down. And also told me how my ummah will kill my Hussein after me. Then Sayyida Fatima produces Sayyida Zainab. And she gives Sayyida Zainab to the Prophet of Islam thinking the first two were males. And obviously they would have gone through what they have gone through. And after the Prophet of Islam told Sayyida Fatima what's going to happen to them after the demise and the martyrdom of the Prophet of Islam, she's thinking to herself that, you know what, this is a lady. How much would a female have to endure? And how much will she see? Will or will not the Prophet of Islam cry in this aspect also? 
And when we find the Prophet of Islam in our narration states that he cried more for Sayyida Zainab than he cried for Imam Hussein and Imam Hassan. And when Fatima al-Zahra asks her father, why is it that you cry more for this lady? And, she be, and he begins to tell her of what will come on the aftermath of Karbala and the patient that she has to show and what she has to endure after the 10th of Muharram. And therefore we see at such a young age, Sayyida Zainab would already have her future set. However, does that mean that her character had anything to influence about that particular position that she will be in? Without a doubt. When Sayyida Zainab was born until the 10th of Muharram, Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra were training her day in, day out. Day in, day out. By first and foremost, showing her. As we know, the first role models to us is when we look at our fathers, when we look at our mothers, the people that we look up to, and we see how they act, how they react, how they pray. And when they do that, we follow in their footsteps. So when they, in the first level, tried to teach Sayyidah Zainab, they became the best role models for them. As in when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib brings Sayyidah Zainab. Look at the beauty at such a young age to give you a definition of her character on the 10th of Muharram and how she can come up with a phrase. When Ubaidullah tells her, how do you view the massacre of Karbala? She says, I have seen nothing but beauty in the eyes of Allah. Four years of age, Ali ibn Abi Talib sits her down. And he says, he says, oh my daughter, say one. She says one. Then he says, say two. She doesn't say anything. Four years of age. Say two, Zainab. Doesn't say anything. Then he asks, he says, oh Zainab, why is it that you do not say two? Look at the reply of Sayyida Zainab at such a young age to give you an idea of what kind of character she was on the 10th of Muharram when she was 55 years of age. Not four, 55 years of age. Imagine how much knowledge, persistence and elevation in the eyes of Allah she gained. She says, oh father, who is she talking to? Ali ibn Abi Talib. She says, oh father, how can the tongue that uttered the oneness of God utter other than one? Four years of age. That's why we don't find it very surprising when Fatima al-Zahra gets up on the pulpit and has her khutbah, in which we refer to as al-khutbah al-fadakiyya. If anyone's read it, they'll know exactly how long it is and how hard it is to memorize. Sayyida Zainab, when you look at the traditions, is one of the narrators of that long khutbah. Five years of age. Slowly, when Ali ibn Talib says about the youth, I want to cultivate their heart before it hardens. I want to plan that which will grow to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where it starts. And that's the upbringing when she looks at Fatima al-Zahra. And she sees when the Prophet knocks on the door with a blind man. Fatima al-Zahra says, do not come in until I wear a hijab. He comes in with the blind man after Fatima al-Zahra wears the hijab and he leaves. He says, oh Fatima, why is it that you wear this hijab? He's a blind man. Fatima al-Zahra replies by saying, it doesn't matter that he cannot see me. There's a certain level of uncomfort and shyness. There's a level of modesty that I have knowing that there's a, a person that's not a mahram to me. Even though he's blind, it's enough that I can see him. She's raised in that household, brothers and sisters. And that's where the aspect of Ali ibn Abi Talib comes. When Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, when they're taken as captives towards Kufa, when he looks at Sayyidah Zainab, he doesn't know that Sayyidah Zainab, no one knew what Sayyidah Zainab looks like. And the biggest dalil and the argument that comes forth is what did Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad say to Sayyidah Zainab? What did Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad say? When they told him, this is Zainab. He begins by saying, you are Zainab. 
You are the one that her father used to extinguish the lantern so no one can see your shadow. You know what the story is? When Sayyidah Zainab would leave the house, she would only live in the darkness of the night. Number one. Number two, she would go out with her father in front of her. Abu Fadl Abbas behind her. Imam Hassan and Hussein on either side. In the night. With a lantern. The story is that Ali ibn Abi Talib used to extinguish that light. So that no one sees the shadow of Sayyidah Zainab. That's how he tried to raise Sayyidah Zainab. The sanctity, the modesty, the hijab. How many levels can we look at in the depths of the hijab of Sayyidah Zainab? That's a topic for a different night. We want to look at the character of Sayyidah Zainab at the moment. That's Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Another, another incident. When al Ash'ath ibn Qais comes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at this incident. So you will realize how much Ali ibn Abi Talib tried to know and let people know who is Sayyida Zainab. Ash'ath ibn Qais comes. Not necessarily one of the most ethical human beings, let's just put it at that, in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anyway, as history goes, he married from the family of the first Khalifa. A lady by the name of Farwa. So he goes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at what he says to Ali ibn Abi Talib and look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib to make you think about who Sayyidah Zainab is. Ash'ad ibn Qais comes. Oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, what is it? He says, I want to propose for your daughter. He says, my daughter? He says, yes. Look at the reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, لَقَدْ جَرَّأَكَ عَلَيْهَا ابْنِ أَبِي قُحَافَةِ Meaning what? Because he's given you from his family, he's given you the audacity to think yourself worthy to even utter the name of Sayyidah Zainab. What does he say? He goes further and look at this line. That in itself shows you the position of Sayyidah Zainab. He says to Al Ash'at ibn Qais, and we all know Ali ibn Abi Talib is not angered on a normal level. He is only angered for the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when he says to Al Ash'at ibn Qais, if you but utter her name on your tongue, just utter her name. If you but utter her name on your tongue, I will cut it for you. Who, Sayyidah Zainab? If you utter her name, I'll cut it for you. In the transition with the Ash'at ibn Qais. To show you the position of Sayyidah Zainab. Now, at a young age. This is how she was raised. In a very brief format in which we want to look at more so Karbala. More so her reactions in Karbala. More so her knowledge. More so her patience. But we need to look at how... She achieved this as a young age before we go on to make more sense of what and how she achieved it in and after the 10th of Muharram. Patience as we know. And quickly summarizing it so we can move on. Patience embodies that you have knowledge of an outcome. As in, I'll give you a very, very close example. When someone has an illness, when someone has an illness, let's say I have an illness, and inshallah Allah raises any illness from anyone here, and any of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. But if someone has an illness, we find people go of two ways. One way would say that, you know what, why me? Why has Allah given this illness to me? And they won't be thankful. Why? Because they don't see the long vision. However, if you have knowledge, and what do I mean by knowledge? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, number, number one, he says in chapter 2, verse 285 of the Holy Quran, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden a soul more than it can handle. That's the first level. So you know, first and foremost, Allah knows that you can handle that illness. Number two, he says, whenever I've given you a burden, on the first level, it's taking away from your sins. 
So if you have an illness, number one, Allah says, if you have an illness, that's a burden. And a burden takes away from your sins. So when you have an illness, a cold, a fever, a pain, Allah is decreasing from your sins one at a time. And if you don't have any sins, Allah is elevating your rank. That's the mercy of Allah. Now, if you had the knowledge of that outcome, you would have the patience, wouldn't you? You'd say, well, I'll be patient with this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rewarding me for it, isn't he? And that's the difference between if someone, if someone was on the 10th of Muharram and didn't have patience, didn't have knowledge that this is exactly what Allah wanted to happen versus someone knowing exactly what that message stood for and the only means in which Islam will stay steady up until tonight. That's the difference. Knowledge. And because of her knowledge, she is known as the mountain and the embodiment of patience. So whenever someone says, well, I have a hardship in my life, a calamity, remember Sayyidah Zainab. And I guarantee you, you remember one, the smallest, if we can call it small, calamity that, be, that happened to Sayyidah Zainab or befell Sayyidah Zainab. I guarantee you the smallest thing that we think it is will overcome any hardship that we'll be having on a daily basis, brothers and sisters. Know that for a fact. When Allah says, don't look at someone that's greater than you in a rank. Because you'll never be thankful towards Allah. Always look at people that are less fortunate. In which you will thank Allah for what He has given you. And I say this first and foremost, when you go towards Mashaya, when you go towards the shrines of Ahlul Bayt, when you cling onto that shrine and you see people left, right and center, the person without a limb, the person that's blind, the person that's paralyzed, and you say to yourself, what am I wishing from Allah when I have everything I've ever wanted? And I, thank, I think to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to raise our voices and allow salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The patience of Sayyidah Zainab embodies. There's two particular aspects that I want to look at before moving on to the greatness of Sayyidah Zainab. And the greatest aspect that Sayyidah Zainab did on that night. The first of which is Salatul Layl. Let's take it into context. Sayyidah Zainab, after the massacre of her brothers, of her sons, of her Ahlul Bayt, after all that that she's endured, after running from one tent to another, after seeing her nieces and her Ahlul Bayt, small children trampled on by the horses or burnt alive because the fire caught on their clothes, all of that, imagine it, how much can a woman handle? As we know, the beauty of a female is her fragility, her gentleness, her emotional aspect. That's the beauty of it. But how much can a woman withstand? At 55 years of age, all of that happens. We find on the 11th, Sayyidah Zainab is in night prayers. Imam Zain al-Abidin calls out, to, her, to his auntie. Once, twice, three times. Then he gets a reply. He says, where were you, oh auntie? He says, I was, she says, I was praying Salatul Layl. Now we think to ourselves, Imam Zain al-Abidin being a ma'asum tells her that all this calamity that's already befell you, the massacre of your brothers, the massacre of your children, the massacre of your Ahlul Bayt, the burning of the children alive, being trampled on by the horses. That's enough. Why are you praying Salatul Layl? Imam Zain al Abidin says, he says, it's the first time I see you praying Salatul Layl whilst you're sitting. And she replies by saying, the calamities have made me weak. But even in this weakness, I do not forget who I am, what I represent. 
and the mission that I have to accomplish. Sayyidah Zainab. Knowledge, patience, application. That's why when we say Sayyidah Zainab, many people look at it, she's a role model for the females. No, she's a role model for humanity. Any aspect you take from Sayyidah Zainab's life, try to apply it to yours. Look how much difficulty you will find. Us on a normal basis, we're sleeping in. We're not waking up for Salat al-Layl. Sayyidah Zainab, the calamities, Salat al-Layl. That's a difference. That's why when we pray to Allah on these nights, we want to pray that He gives us tawfiq, first and foremost, to wake up the nights. And secondly, to pray. One, two, and this is arguably one of the greatest moments of Sayyidah Zainab's, let's say, stances on the 10th of Muharram. As we know, Imam Hussein, as every sacrifice comes in, one dies after the other, he prays, and each one has a different prayer. Imam Hussein, one of them, he holds them. One, he says, May Allah purify your face. One says, may Allah grant you amongst the angels. One, he says, may Allah give you from Al-Kawthar. Now the question arises, if every companion, Imam Hussein offered him as a sacrifice towards Allah, who then offered Imam Hussein as a sacrifice? Gentle heart, Sayyidah Zainab, but firm on religion. After the massacre of Karbala, massacre, she goes in the night. Now you can imagine walking between bodies, bodies that you've woken up every morning seeing their faces. Your sons, your brothers, your Ahlul Bayt, walking on their decapitated bodies, their mingled limbs, bodies that were stolen, everything from them was stolen. The narration states to us that Imam Hussein on the 10th, before he goes out, he tells Sayyidah Zainab, oh, say, oh Zainab, give me clothes to wear that I know these evil people, let's just keep it at that, I want to use the phrases, will not steal from me. She brings him clothes in which he rips. So he says it's not worthy to be taken away. And even that clothes or those clothes were taken away. Other narration says they were shredded to bits after the horse riders trampled on the body of Abu Abdullah. Imagine she's walking through that until she goes. What kind of state was Imam Hussein in? I want you to realize. I want you to envision Use the power of your imagination. A decapitated head. Trampled. From his front and from his back. By horses. What kind of heart did Sayyidah Zainab have? She puts her hand under the body of Abu Abdullah. She raises the body, or what's left of the body. And she looks at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She looks towards the heavens. And look at what she says. To give you an idea of the knowledge of this woman. She says, Taqabbal minna hadha al-qaleel. Oh Allah, accept this little that we have offered towards you. Sayyidah Zainab. And that's why people look at different stances that Sayyidah Zainab has had throughout her journey. When she talks in the face of Yazid, when she talks in the courtroom of Abaydullah ibn Ziyad. But I tell you, one of the greatest positions that she was in is when she had to hold what was left of the body of Aba Abdullah and offer it as a sacrifice towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine. A face that you wake up to is light. A face in which the narration states to us 
that everyone will look towards the illuminating face of Imam Hussein and forget that such a thing called Hur al -Ain. What kind of face does Imam Hussein have? Imagine, brothers and sisters. One, two. Imam Zain al Abidin tells us of Sayyidah Zainab. When Abu Hamza Thimali comes and he sees Imam Zain al Abidin crying and crying, and he says, Ama ana li Is it not come for a time for your sadness? To end, he says, Allah has granted you this rank of martyrdom. And he has honored you with this. He says, yes, O Abu Hamza. He says, however, it's not for me that I cry. He says, why do you cry? He says, have you ever heard for Ahlul Bayt or for the Hashemites ever in history that there was a prisoner taken from their woman. How about my auntie Zainab that went from one tent to another, from one city to another, and her face veil was taken off, and she had to veil her face with her hands. He says, that's what makes me cry. One of our ulama has a dream about Imam Sahib al-Asri was Zaman. And he asks the Imam, he says, you say, in Ziyarat Nahiya, and we have it massively written on the back wall. Who is that person that you cry for? And that's the phrase we're going to analyze on the 10th night, insha'Allah, in depth. So the alim says to Imam Sahib al-Asri was Zaman. He says to him, is it for Imam Hussein? Imam replies by saying, if Imam Hussein was here, he would have also cried. He says, then it might be for Ali al Akbar. Is it for Ali al Akbar? He says, no. If Ali al Akbar saw, he would also cry. Abu Fadl al-Abbas? He says, no. Surely Abu Fadl al-Abbas, if he saw, he would also cry. He says, why do you cry? Who? Imam Sahib al-Asri was Zaman. He says, I cry for my auntie. When she goes from one tent to another. When she goes from one city to another. Look at the patience that this woman had. What did she endure? Imagine how much she endured and how much she changed. When she goes back towards Medina. The analysis that we have when Imam Zain al-Abidin comes back. And we all know the story. When he tells the Sha'ar, tells him, he goes to him, make sure that you go and gather the people and tell them about Karbala. One aspect is to tell them, yes, Ya Ahl Yathrib, la maqama lakum biha, get everyone together. But the main idea is so that everyone is distracted. So Sayyidah Zainab and the Sabaya all go towards the house of Imam Hussein. As he's doing this, who comes in front of him? Abdullah ibn Jafar, who's that? That's the husband of Sayyidah Zainab. Let's look at this in depth, brothers and sisters. Her husband, Imam Zain al Abidin, is there. And he's coming. Abdullah ibn Jafar comes. And they're talking amongst themselves, in which Abdullah ibn Jafar looks and he says, Who's that with you? Imam Zain al-Abidin, who's that woman with you? Well, that's why we look at what befell Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab replies by saying, you don't even know your own wife. Because of what has befell me from the calamities of the 10th and the aftermath. When Hind, as we know the famous tradition, in the court of Yazid, she finds out that there's people from Medina that were caught as captives, as they told them. She says, where? From Medina? They might know where I'm from. Hind was a servant in the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So she sits down amongst the sabaya. She asks one of the women, she tells them, you're from Medina? 
The woman says, yes. He says, I serve the holy household. She says, which household? She says, I serve the household of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So she says, do you know of the holy household that I served? What household? The household of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She says, yes. She says, then you would know Sayyida Zainab. You would know Imam Hussein. You would know Aba Fadl al-Abbas. She says, I know them very well. She says, can you tell me of them? How are they? What has been happening with their lives? So she says, you want to know about Sayyida Zainab? She says, yes. She says, Zainab is sitting in front of you. You want to know about Aba Fadl al-Abbas? He's head on that spear. You want to know about Imam Hussein? And she points and she says, his head's on that spear. And that's the calamities that's befell, that hint runs in to Yazid's court. Yazid goes off at her. Why? She didn't have a face covering. She says, you go off at me while you've taken the face veils of the daughters of Al Muhammad. And that's the calamities that have befallen on Sayyida Zainab. Now let's end by looking at the Qasam of Sayyida Zainab. What's the Qasam of Sayyida Zainab that we want to uphold now? When Sayyida Zainab comes and she sees Zain al Abidin in a state of sorrow, what does she say? She says, Mali ara katajudu bi nafsika ya baqiyata ahli. Why is it that I see you in such a saddened state? Oh, you that's remained from my household. Look at what she says about the calamity of Karbala to make you analyze that this woman is beyond that which we can imagine. Beyond the knowledge that we can comprehend that this woman had a vision. Till the end of time. How? She says to Imam Zain al Abidin, she says, For Allah, remember, Qasem, for Allah, innahu ahdun, a covenant. Min Allah li jaddika wa abik, wa sayunsabu alamun, fil taf, ala kurur il layali wal ayyam, wa sayishtahidan, a imat al kufr. What does she say? She says, it's a covenant between Allah, your father and your grandfather. And there will be a flag that will be raised in Taf, in Karbala. That's all of the kuffar. And she names A'immatul Kufr. And the evildoers will come together collaboratively and say what? To want to remove and lower this. What does she say? What does she say? Can we say or can we not say that Sayyidah Zainab 1400 years ago or 1300 plus say at that time that this flag will only be raised and elevated more and more and more and everyone against this message will combine and try to remove it. However, every time they try to put it down, it elevates and elevates, isn't it? Therefore, she was or wasn't truthful in that which she said. She's truthful without a doubt. And that's why her names and her stances remain till today. She is elevated in such a rank. I want to give you an example of how important Sayyidah Zainab is. And how much Allah has chosen to remember her name. Who's gone to Karbala? Show of hands, who's gone to Karbala? Who's gone to Mashaya? Who's gone to Imam Hussein? Inshallah, anyone that has... Inshallah, Allah will give them another chance. And anyone that hasn't will, give, will be given the reward of going towards Ziyarah. 
When you go, there's a particular shrine. It's called the Tell Zainabi. I want to show you how much Allah has elevated this woman. When I go and I visit that shrine, when I go and put my cheek on that dust, when I take my cloth and wipe it for blessings on Tell Zainabi, do you think that anyone prayed there? Anyone was buried there? What's, with, what's Tell Zainabi? It's a patch of sand, an elevated patch, in which Sayyida Zainab blessed with her foot. Put her foot there, Allah chooses for that footstep to be remembered throughout history till today. And her name to be remembered throughout history till today. And for her to be an example for both men, women, till today. So when we remember Zainab, brothers and sisters, we remember her patience. We remember her stances. We remember her knowledge and her application. And in that, I think, brothers and sisters, we'll end for tonight. I've gone over my time frame and I apologize for everyone. But inshallah, we've learned about the life of Sayyida Zainab. And inshallah, we've taken the little to appreciate in a significant level more of this great lady. This lady with vision. This lady that stood for this message. When we have the example that we're given. Look at this beauty. Even though it's a sad example, but it's a beautiful example. When we find... Taghiyat al-Araq. I don't want to mention his name on the pulpit. When he goes and kills one of our ulama, and he also kills the, his sister. When the people came and asked him, why are you killing his sister for? Kill the alim. One of our greatest ulama. Kill them. Why kill his sister for? But they massacred both of them. What was the reply? He says, I don't want to make the same mistake Yazid made. Yazid, his biggest downfall was Sayyida Zainab and her speech. How she moved mountains and how she spoke eloquently. Her eloquence was from her father, the master of eloquence. And we pray to Allah that we may follow the footsteps of Sayyida Zainab, inshallah. We raise our hands in dua for the mu'mineen and the mu'minat, the people of them that are alive and the deceased, the people that have someone to remember them and the ones that do not. And we pray to Allah on this night that we may raise ourselves and try to follow in the teachings, the patience, the knowledge, and the application of that of Sayyida Zainab. With Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat, Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.